Hello, everybody. Wow, this is, I am honored. Often I start in this particular hour with uh, four people, and then it builds up after a while, but uh, this is good. This is good. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you. We pray that you'll give us wisdom as we, as we look into your word. We certainly need it these days. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we had gotten to Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Now, what's interesting is we're going to be covering some ground, maybe in a more condensed version than that we've already covered in the book of Ephesians. But um, I still think it's important ground to cover, and so we'll, we'll go ahead and read it and talk about it. It says here, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Have we read that before anywhere? Ephesians. Yes, we have in Ephesians. And then it says, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Have we read that anywhere before? And then in the next verse, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Again, it's more condensed, not as much detail as given in the other passage in Ephesians. And then fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Have you heard that before? Yes, you have. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Now, there's a little more fleshing out in that part, isn't there? So let's just go ahead back to the beginning, beginning in all of it. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting of the Lord. Again, we looked at it before. What is, is there anything noteworthy in this passage that we need to remember? And what might that be? Submit. Submit. Gary. The obligations are reciprocal. It's never one-sided. Yeah. The husband needs to do something. The wife needs to do something. That's right. And the same as the children and the parents. And maybe, may, I think I mentioned this before, and maybe I'm... Uh, Speculating, I guess I am speculating a little bit, but it seems like the wife is called to do something that's pretty hard. And I know the husband is called to do something that he needs to learn how to do. I don't know very many husbands who walk down the aisle knowing exactly how to love his wife well. We liked him a whole lot, but but we had that requires learning and understanding and experience and, and work. Yes, Jerry? Just, uh, uh, we sometimes gloss over the last part of that. Yeah. Uh, in, in other words, it's not a blanket, whatever the husband says goes. Mm -hmm. There are limits to the uh, leadership authority. And who is our primary obligation then? It's God. Christ. It's to God. Yeah, all of this is in the context of a prior submission to God. Um, now, anything else in this about the wives or the husbands? Yes. Well, it's a God appointed order. He did. I mean, it's just in an order. He a... did. He, he, he's, he has established all sorts of authorities in this world, has he not? This is, we're talking here about the authority in the family. This morning I was talking about God setting up authority in the, in the temporal realms, right? I mean, who anointed the first two kings of Israel? God did, actually. He told Samuel, go anoint Saul. <coughs> And he told Samuel, go to the house of Jesse, where he anointed David. Um, and, and in the case of the house of Jesse, does anybody remember how that played out? How many sons did Jesse have? Seven. 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 And which was the son that was chosen? The youngest. Numero siete, the seventh one. The youngest one was chosen. And who did Samuel want to choose? He wanted Eliab, the uh, Eliab, however you, 
I, I learned to pronounce Eliab in, in Spanish, that's how they say it, Eliab, but it's probably Eliab. Um, and uh, yeah, he was tall, good looking, handsome, but God said what? The Lord looks on the heart. Linda. Well, you know, verse 18, <coughs> say that these days, people think your husband wants to beat you and do all this stuff to you. You know, submission is, is, is a bad word mm -hmm. anymore. And even when we got married, that was a long time ago, we wrote <coughs> a lot of our own wedding vows. And we got married in the church and most of our relatives, I mean, all of our relatives were not members of the church. And part of our vows, we said, was um, to show my signs of submission to my husband, would I be willing to take his family name as my own? Wow. Right after the wedding. I mean, I mean, in the receiving yes. line, my cousin came up and said, well, you didn't really mean all those things you said, did you? <laughs> like, they thought... Um, they didn't realize we wrote the vows. They thought it was Church of Christ pro forma. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and here we put all this effort into writing our own vows, you know, and even. So they made a scene in the reception because they objected to your submission, submission. to your husband. They, yeah, they just asked, you know, and, and the thing is, even like if I'm out shopping for something or looking for something, um, I know there was an instance when I was looking at like a sewing machine or a grocery machine or something. And, and I said, well, I have to tell my husband about this. What do you mean you have to call your husband? Well, this is a big expenditure, you know. What does your husband have to do with it? Whoa. Well, you know, in our marriage, I'm not going to go out and spend that kind of money without discussing it first. People in the world don't understand that. No. You know, well, it's your money. Just do what you want with it. Well, no, it's our money. Although the chances of me saying no are in general. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rumor based. Do you see that? <laughs> Submission and knowing the lay of the land. <laughs> love, love, love. That's, yes, love, love. He I'm, has I'm, said no to me. Oh, they have a different res visceral response to the word submission oh, yeah. than, 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 than we do. We follow, well, again, what's our primary submission? To the Lord Jesus Christ. And out of that flows every, everything else because the same Christ who died for our sins, submitting to his Father's will, submitting to death, purchasing our pardon for us in a gruesome and horrible way tells us we must do the same in the church to one another. Remember that? We read that in, we read that in Ephesians, didn't we? Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. And then all of these other relationships involve, involve submission. Yes, Miss Kathy. Well, this, and I know the world doesn't read this, but this is all in the context of He's starting in, in verse one, not carnality, but Christ. Right. Right. We are leaving aside the ways of the world. Yes, Matthew. It's also very <clears throat> important to go with the, what you preached this morning about the word of God and how important it is to understand where Paul would say something in like 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, that he goes around teaching this Everywhere he goes. <clears throat> everywhere he goes. These, these are the commands of God. They are taught everywhere. And something people do today to try to alter this is go, well, that's just cultural. Mm -hmm. It only applied to them and their particular congregation. Yeah. And it's foolishness. It's just a way to get around what the Word of God actually exactly. says. Because he taught it everywhere he went, which mm -hmm. was not just in this congregation or this region. It was for everybody who was to submit to God. And in a sense, it was culture because a new culture was being established. Amen. The foundation for things that we, you called it pro forma with the Church of Christiness <laughs> or, some, or something like that. 
you know, what we call, because of our familiarity, if you were a pew baby, you grew up in it, okay? Uh, the eyes of the world is revolutionary. And it was certainly revolutionary 2,000 years ago when, when all of this, you know, the, we talk about the wife submitting. The fact is the church was probably the most feministy, feminist-ish organization in the world, in the ancient world, because the women had some protections that they did not have in the, in the, in the broader culture. Yes. <coughs> By the way, if you were recalling it, the word feminist, I'm not really using that accurately, and I know that. Go ahead. No, I think if I didn't know God, I wouldn't submit the way I'm submitting my life right now. So, so your submission to God is having an impact on your relationship with your girl. Yeah. 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 Yes, ma'am. One thing I really appreciate about these verses is it shows how well God knows us because it kind of gets to like our most basic intrinsic needs. He doesn't say, <clears throat> excuse me, that you, women should respect their husbands and husbands should respect their, their wives. He says, wives should submit to their husbands or respect their husbands, and that husbands need to love their wives. Men's most, men generally want respect and women generally want love. Yeah. So when we do this right, we are meeting our own needs in the marriage mm -hmm. in a wonderful way. Yeah. And I think the converse is, is, I think the word would be the converse is also true. I think the men are challenged in ways that they're broken. And I think the women are challenged in ways that they're broken. Again, uh, I wish Kim were here to hear what I'm about to say. <laughs> but I have found in our 34 years of marriage that the real challenge for her was trusting that I wasn't going to mess it up. And that's what I needed. I needed that respect. That, you know, I need. I need that again. I need that more than I need than I need love. I need her to think that I'm a man worthy of following. And I'll just say, in our family, that was where we were challenged. She was challenged, and and not without some reason because I made mistakes. And in our family, that was where I was challenged. I had in the area of love. I had to learn how to love in a way that communicated I love you to her. It wasn't just loving according to, well, she'll probably like this. No. After years, I realized she really, really wanted to me to make that cup of tea at night. So I make the cup of tea. After years, of, I've realized, especially since the kids have left the house, that she really, really wants me to help around the house. We were both, you know, when we had the kids, we were both just kind of trying to survive it. And I was out doing what I could to, to, to make a living and, you know, make things happen. And she was doing what she could to wrangle the kids. And, you know, it was, we kind of got into this, it wasn't really separate lives, but we had separate spheres of, of operation. I'm having to learn a whole new Kim now. And she's having to learn a whole new Danny now. And, and uh, it takes effort. It, and it's not natural. None of it's natural. Is it? You, you guys have been married a long time. It just came natural to you, didn't it? <laughs> exactly. Okay. So husbands love your wives. This one really. Husbands love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Think about that a moment. There's got to be a reason that was said. That wouldn't have been said if, if it wasn't a temptation for some husbands to be bitter to their wives. Yes, sir. Will. Well, you know, of course, I'm a little old school, and uh, I can think back to when my parents were married and stuff, and uh, of course, there was one breadwinner in the family, my father. He went out and he worked, you know, he worked at least, I can remember him working two jobs, sometimes three, to, you know, provide for my mom and us. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, two children, and uh, that that upbringing that I got always instilled in me the responsibility <coughs> that I had to being a provider for, yeah. for my family. You know, you know, I'm the man. You know, right? <laughs> and but it goes beyond that. You know, uh, 
when you look at when this was written, the submission, you know, that was a different day and age in regards to uh, how women were treated. Yes. Okay? And thank you. Even in this day and age, we haven't been, we haven't progressed that far where that did not happen in our society. Okay? Maybe what? 100 years ago. Specifically, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the man is the man. And oh. Nobody can argue with him. Mm -hmm. Okay? I'm the, and, king, I'm the king of the castle. Yeah. And, you know, in some ways, a lot of this stuff is, is, is there for us to recognize the fact that uh, when you have God in the picture, we're, we're all subject to, to God. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the rules have got to be spelled out. And I think that's what Paul was doing, you know, from the Holy Spirit, that they needed to know how to treat each other. And when you get away from the word, all right, you lose track of all that. And I think that's why today in a lot of marriages, when people start out, they have a prenuptial agreement. Or I have my money, you have your money. You know, I can do what I want. I don't need your say-so as to what I'm going to do or, or not do, okay? And mm -hmm. when you take God out of the picture, all right, it's anything can go. That's right. You know? And so that it's, I think a lot of it is fear. We're afraid that if this doesn't go well in the relationship, this way at least I can keep what I have and you can keep what you have. Mm -hmm. And well, the kids, well, we'll work that out, you know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, too much compartmentalization. It's too much. It's a lot of fear. But, you know, you know God can drive out that fear. Right. You know, and, and I don't see, you know, if you follow God's ways, there is a lot less fear. All right. That doesn't mean it's a perfect marriage or a perfect relationship, but it, it, I'm thankful <coughs> that God, you know, we became Christians five years after we were married. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw a difference in our life. We, we saw, you know, a format to follow, and we saw people who were living the format that God had established, which was an inspiration to us. Okay. You know, not that we didn't have our rocky roads. We so you had the word, yeah. but you also had other people in your world that were living out that word. Yep. So you had examples to follow, and that gave you hope that if it worked for them, yep. and it's worked for you, how <laughs> Okay. Now, Kathy, did you raise your hand or were you? Scratching. Okay. <laughs> I saw this and then it descended. Um, all right. That's funny. I didn't think we were going to talk much about this, but it, it, it really is where the it really is where the culture is is um, completely in opposition to what the to what God's word said. What what Doug said happened at our wedding too. I was, uh, my dad did the, did the uh, wedding ceremony, uh, words upon which I've based every wedding that I've done since. I borrowed heavily from my father whenever I do a wedding because uh, he was a wise man and knew the word. And he talked about Kim following my lead and submitting to me in the wedding. And Kim had invited a, uh, a friend's father to the wedding who was a preacher, let's see if you know, uh, if you know how to judge things. He was a preacher in the United Church of Christ. Now, if he's in that particular group, what would you anticipate would be his attitude toward feminism? Even in the 80s, he was very much of the, of the feminist bent. Mm -hmm. And he started causing trouble in the reception. He went after my dad and just got in his face and he shouldn't have, and then he came after me. And he was making a beeline toward my bride. This man who came because of love for my bride was making a beeline toward her. And, and Kim said, oh, I need to go talk to, and I said, and I steered her out of uh, harm's way because I knew what was gonna happen. She had no idea why I was so uh, assertive in that moment. But it would have been an ugly scene. Why? Because the word of God is offensive. That was the first day I learned about how the word of God offends people. 
If we do, if we walk in the path on which he has called us to walk and how we arrange our families, there are going to be people that get angry at us. I've had people come to me and say, You're, when, when the kids were little, I'm sorry, somebody pushed a button, so you just got to listen to me play it out here. Uh, I, 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 people came to us when our kids were little and they said, well, Danny, Kim, how do y'all, you know, how, how do you keep the kids so orderly and well-behaved? And uh, frankly, it was answered to prayer because I, I did ask God to arrange our family such that our order would draw people to him. And, and, I, would, and I would tell them, well, this is what we do. And it was all biblical stuff. And then they get mad and walk off. That happened more than once. They don't want to do some, some. Some will be drawn to the order that God establishes and others will be repulsed by it. Again, the word of God divides. Yes, Miss Frieda, you probably have something much more wise to say. I was raised in the church and I grew up watching my mother submit to my father. Mm -hmm. So that's how I learned. That's how you learned. And how many years were you and Dick married? I was married 53 years, 54 years with Dick. Wow. Wow. And you learned all of that from your mother. Okay. Yes. And something Linda said, I really caught my ear about talking about taking your husband's family name because showing that submission there shows yeah. that you're entering into an agreement where you're trusting that person to protect you and to provide for your needs and to take care of you and how even that's a battle today about people keeping their own names or, or doing stuff like that but the symbolism is there not because of patriarchy it's there because you are now in an agreement and a relationship with someone who is going to provide you with these tangible benefits and as we read in Ephesians chapter 5 and even here, this marriage relationship is modeled after Christ and the church. That's and right. is it any wonder that when we submit our lives to God, we get that new name of Christian? That is the name he gave us, and we took on his name because he provides those benefits for us. So it's just supposed to be a model of that, that we can live out and show other people how it works. And like with what Will said, it does work and people can see that. And when they see it work well, it reflects well on God. So as the bride of Christ, we take on the name of Christ. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts on this before we move on? Covered two verses. Children, obey your parents. There aren't any kids here, but again, that's... That, that, that teaching is clear, I suppose. But let's look at parents. And again, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Don't provoke your children. And in other places, don't provoke them to wrath. Yes? If, I'm going to go back to the children of your parents. I think we have a lot of parents that are afraid to make their children obey. But yes, there are children here, but you know, it, it's the parent's responsibility. You're the adult in this. That's a good catch. Thank you for slowing me down. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, as parents, have a job of civilizing people who would not otherwise become civilized. Yes. As parents, when we when we look at who we are and who we when we talk to somebody about things, we often say we're raising our children. And yeah, okay, that's true. They are children. But the pro sometimes the what we hold on to is the concept that they are our children. And they will always be our children. Okay, another truism. That's true. My kid, my two daughters will always be my children. However, in the training world, if we talk about raising children, we might just end up with children. We may not end up with adults. So as a trainer, if I am training you to take over my job, 
I w don't want you to be always being in training for my job. I want you to know my job. If my job is currently an adult, I want to train an adult. Yes, they are three, four, five, 18, 32, whatever age they are. Mm -hmm. What's my goal? My goal is to train an adult. How would my child be like they are right now as an adult? Mm -hmm. Whiny, crying, always wanting their way, always being boisterous. That, do I want that in my child? No, I don't. I want my child to be an adult, and my job as a parent is to make adults <laughs> out of my children. I'm thinking of something, and I'm just going to hold on. <laughs> it's a joke that I don't need to tell. Yes. Friday just had me click with something. Um, we were in counseling, well, we had been several years of counseling. With <coughs> and one of the last counseling sessions I was in, um, we were in with Kayla. Mm -hmm. And this was three years ago, four years ago. And the way the counselor set it up, this is free speech. You can say what you want to say. In counseling. In counseling. Right. Okay, let me tell you that message that he would get out of that. You can say what you want to say no matter what, and he could, and there was no guidelines to the, you know, of things. Right. Even as us as parents. So right. when he got home, what do you think message he got? He did the same thing at home. Oh, yeah, because he could do it. Right. Because this is what this, and, you know, I agree in counseling. We've been to counselors where, you know, if the parents have a guideline at home, well, yes, this is why you need to understand this, blah, blah, blah. But in the free speech, he could say how he felt about that guideline. And um, that is not, and that's a lot of modern thinking with the kids. They have a right to. And so that created some, well, you probably had some reinstructed you had to do in the house. Still working on it. <laughs> He's 18 <laughs> now. He's an adult. He can do what he wants. But no. So it's not allowing, even though we were in counseling, that was not allowing us as parents to say, yes, we have guidelines to have a healthy home, and this is why. Right. Linda. I wasn't sure if it was Doug or Linda. I saw a hand back there. That was mine. Okay. Um, I think we have a big problem now because parents don't make their kids be obedient. <coughs> there's no discipline in yeah. households anymore. So you see it, you know, it starts when they're toddlers, but as they get older, and then they go into schools, and the kids don't have discipline in schools because the parents go after the teachers mm -hmm who try to discipline the kids, but because the kids don't get discipline at home, mm -hmm. and if they send a note home or something to the parent, no, my kid wouldn't do that. Oh, you have the wrong kid. Yeah. And it goes on as they get older and older, and Katie, where she works with kids all the time now, sees it where she works. Mm -hmm. And But also when she had a different job and she was hiring teenagers, she, she would come home and say, but, but mom, the parents want to come in with them for their job interview. You don't need parents coming with kids for their job interview. The parents aren't being hired. Right. You know? Or let's say they're supposed to get off at 4 o'clock. Okay, but this is what you're supposed to finish before your job is over. Over. So maybe sometimes you don't get out of work till 5 or 10 after 4. But parents are at the door knocking saying, um, how come my child's not off work yet at 4 or 1, I'm here to pick them up, and not understanding, well, your kid has to finish their work. Or parents letting their kids call in sick all the time. When my kids, when Katie was in high school and she learned, had a job, I never let her call in sick, unless she was truly sick. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, you're scheduled to work, you work. Mm -hmm. and, she, and to this day at 38, she'll say, you know, Mom, I remember when, mm -hmm. and, and she'll go back to that. But kids aren't taught, taught these disciplines. It's kind of goes back to a little bit what Freddie said. As adults, they're not working right. 
because uh, they weren't taught that. And, and you see that more and more these days. You know, they say they come out of college and they don't know how to hold on to do a job. They want their safe space. Yeah. There's not safe spaces in adult world. And, and, and they just need to be taught discipline. And, and when it says, you know, children to be obedient, mm -hmm. parents aren't teaching them to be obedient. You know, they think there's something wrong. Okay. So, can we all agree that there are some aspects of this doctrine that we're looking at here that <clears throat> goes against the... The world. The, the world. culture today. Yes. Okay. Can we agree that in some respect, Christianity is the counterculture? Maybe it, maybe it isn't completely yet, but... Every day that goes by, we are more and more different from, from what the culture is. Now, I agree with everything that's been said, and it's upsetting, and it, and it, is, uh, it, it is dangerous, but let me give you the good side of it. If we will walk in the light as he is in the light, it, and we will raise our children the way God has called us to raise our children, and we look more and more Amish, if you will, in the eyes of the world, odd in the eyes of the world, the world is gonna see more and more clearly how our way is different from theirs and they're gonna be drawn to the Christ that established our ways. So you raising your kids the way you're supposed to raise them and us teaching others to raise their children the way the Bible enjoins is evangelism. More and more every day. Every time a homeschooling family gets arrested, right now it's happening in foreign countries, it could come our way. That is actually, they're almost always Christians, and that's lifting up Christ. If we will walk the way we're supposed to walk, no matter how high the cost may be, you're showing people Christ. Yes, Marco. I have a question. When I read about the scripture and with like children, mm -hmm. especially Paul, he really emphasizes on fathers with children from my understanding. Mm -hmm. So Why? fathers don't exasperate your kids. Yeah, it's mostly on the father and the children from what I'm reading. I don't know if it's like this, I'm just... I want to ask somebody who, you might have studied more Greek than I have, Matthew, where it says fathers in the original Greek, is it like, like Spanish in as much as in Spanish, you've got madre and padre, but if it's plural, it's padres, which is not fathers, Father. it's parents. Is that the way Greek is with right. that word? Okay, so really this word is not just to the fathers. <laughs> Because in the original Greek, it wouldn't have been read as just to the fathers. It's parents. Am, 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 I, miss, am I messing that up? I, I could touch on that a little bit. Okay. Because one thing that you can usually see is that mothers do tend to be more nurturing. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be a little bit more soft and caring, mm -hmm. which is good. Fathers do have a tendency to become angry or exhausted or sometimes violent a lot faster mm -hmm. so in that context it would really apply to fathers as well with less patience okay that they needed to to be that but let's not forget the link with the kids and the wife because if the kids are seeing the wife submit to the husband uh -huh. then they're going to be more likely to submit but if you have a wife who's just rebellious against her husband why, why would they listen to their dad either so in that sort of sense, the fathers would have the final say because the wife is submitting to them. So if he has final say over the wife, he also has final say over the kids. And in that way, he's not supposed to mm -hmm. exasperate them and provoke them because ultimately they don't answer to mom, they answer to dad. Okay. Yes, Jerry. Also, I think what the verse is talking to, sometimes parents are so strict that no matter what the child does, they fall short of the mark. Right. And, and the child gets to the point, well, what's the use of even trying? I'm never going to make it. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the letters in Revelation to the seven churches, the writer always talks about the positive first, 
but then they say, this I have against you. Right. And it says, if you do this, so when it <coughs> falls short, tell them what they need to do to get back to how to do it properly. And, and as fathers, we, we need to be sensitive to that because each one of our child are different. And, and, and we ought not to be so strict and uh, demanding that, that the child become discouraged and, and, and gets to the point that there's nothing I, nothing I can do is ever going to please this guy. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to do anything to try and please this guy. You have to give them the hope or at least give them a chance or the belief that they can succeed yeah. and show them how they can succeed mm -hmm. and guide them. And even when they, it's like when you're teaching a child to walk, you know, they fall four times. Well, you don't even want to fall. You pick them up and, and off they go. Right. They fall again, you pick them up. Mm -hmm. and off they go. It's the same thing. Yeah. And as parents, if a child makes a mistake, you correct them uh -huh. lovingly, mm -hmm. teach them how to properly do it, and let them go. If they mess up again, again, you correct them lovingly, teach them how to do it, just like God does with us. When we fail, when we sin, mm -hmm. we get back up, we confess our sin, we get forgiven, and we continue on. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with parents. I remember from my youth when I was, um, ever, if I ever had to deal with a teacher or a coach, that no matter what happened, it was like you couldn't figure out which way to go. And though, and I was a, I was a real smart aleck, so th those were the ones that I ended up honing my skills in smart aleckism or undercutting or disrespecting. Those are the ones that I disrespected were the ones that no matter which way you go, there's no way to do right. And as parents, we gotta be careful in that in that regard. We can be so, so, you just said it, Jerry. We, if they've got nowhere to go, they're gonna come at you. Yes, you got the last word, because it's, uh, Oh no, then, then Kathy's got the last well, word after one you. One thing I wanted to bring up is like like Will said about marriage, there's a lot of fear here because in a marriage with the rules and the laws we have today, somebody can just wake up, a husband or a wife, and decide they're going to leave and then wreck the rest of your life and take everything you have. Mm -hmm. And same thing with kids. They have so much access to information and technology. All they have to do is tell one person you hit them or that you touched them inappropriately or that you, you said something bad. And there's going to be an investigation and it's not great, but the way that we get rid of this and the way that we nullify it is by following the word of God and having healthy marriages and families around us. So that way we can see how it operates <coughs> well and get in that vein and just to not be afraid to do what God says. Yeah, we've got to do what we've got to do what God says. And yes, we need to honor the law of the land, but that is who's our primary obligation to is the Lord Jesus Christ. Kathy, go ahead. Brady said something that his children would always be his children, but they're always God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, we will. Uh, and sometimes we forget that. And that is the end game, is we want to be with, we want to, we want them to be there. We want our kids to be there. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, I pray that you will uh, build up Christian homes in this generation. Build us up in courage to advocate and be Christian homes. Protect us from the evil. Draw us toward the good. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.